You're listening to The Brand Compass, conversations to navigate your way to building a brand fit for purpose and poised for success. Here's your host, Shelley Rosland. Hello there, my friend, and wow, another two weeks has gone by. Gosh, time is just flying. Thank you for choosing to listen to us today. I'm Shelley, your host on this conversational journey, and boy, do I have a topic for you. When you start working on your brand strategy, you do four big chunks of work. You crystallize your purpose, you shape your personality, you define your proposition, and you design the experience you want others to have of you. In today's episode, we're going to hone in on one of those chunks, your proposition. In plainer terms, this is what you are physically selling and delivering to your ideal customers or clients. As usual, these conversations are so much better if I can get somebody who's been in the trenches to come and join me, and today's no different. I've asked a well-seasoned creative professional who's been there and bought the t-shirt in working out what is his marketable value, and is certainly amplifying that very well. So let me introduce him to you now. Darren Smith is a film producer, author, podcast host, and business strategist. He started his business Craftsman Creative after over a decade of running a video production company and working as a freelancer on projects for businesses ranging from startups to Fortune 50 companies. Not even 100, folks, Fortune 50. So while he is still producing feature length films, he's also a trained business coach using his deep and wide experience in the creative world to guide other creatives who need help with strategy, outcomes and mindset in their business. So Darren is married to April, who is also a creative. They have three boys and they live in beautiful Provo in Utah. Welcome, Darren. Thank you so, so much, Shelly. This is amazing how this came together. And thank you for like making time in your schedule and making it work with the time difference. I'm just grateful to be here. Thank you. Very, very good. And I've been really looking forward to this, Darren, because we're really new to each other. And I get really excited meeting new people to talk to. And the lovely Mark Masters from episode 15 from You Are The Media, he said we need to meet. So here we are. Mark is a great connector. So thank you, Mark. Shout out to you again. I think I've shouted out to Mark in every one of my podcasts because he's just such a great guy that's always looking out for people. It's amazing. He's so he's so lovely. Right. So I think probably the best place for us to start, Darren, is to perhaps give our listeners a bit of a, a high level insight, if you like, into how you came to start Craftsman Creative, because that will tie in probably with your learning from the pandemic and maybe give us a head start for our topic today. Perfect. Then thank you, because I love talking about this stuff. So Craftsman Creative is a consulting and content business where I help creative individuals, entrepreneurs, business owners grow their businesses to six and seven figures. So my trade is as a film producer. And you might pause there and go, wait, how do those two things connect? And I'm about to tell you. Yeah. So my job as a film producer is basically building businesses very quickly and getting a product ready to go to market. So say we take a million dollars, we hire 100 people in like two months. And in a matter of like a month of shooting and a few months of editing, we have to have a movie, the distribution and the audience all present in order for that endeavor to be successful. And I've done that a number of times now. I'm an international film producer. And the only reason that that is possible is because of systems. So my brain love systems. I love spreadsheets. I love logistics and optimizations and all those things. And what I realized, like right at the beginning of the pandemic is when all of this kind of came to a head. I was working on a TV show as a senior producer and we got furloughed for four months. And for the first time in like my adult career life, I had free time to work on personal projects. I was like, what is this going to be like? (laughs) So basically I took some time to work on this idea that I had. The only thing I had at the time was the name Craftsman Creative. I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't know if it was going to be a business or a brand or what. And so what I did was I started with what I knew, which was filming and editing and video. And so I started a really technical skill. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I started with two of my own courses. I'd always done like lunches with my artistic and creative friends and musician friends, filmmaker friends. And we liked talking about business. I was like, what if I did that at scale? Because 
all of those individuals were really, really struggling at the beginning of the pandemic. They had their yeah. revenue completely ripped out of their lives overnight. Like all the events, all the gigs, everything shut down. And so I started mm -hmm. with two courses that were about that. How do you build a more resilient business that isn't dependent on one revenue stream? How do you make it more profitable, more resilient? And the answer was systems. And so that's what I started with. And then quickly saw that like, oh, there's an opportunity here because I did a, uh, just as a trial, did a, a course with another creator here in Provo. And like I masked up, I went to her house, we filmed it for a day, I edited it in a week and a month later she had her site online. Her course was on my platform and she did 10 grand in a week. I was like, oh, I think there might be an opportunity here. And so over the next two years, I created 15 other courses and then as things started to open back up, I did another season of the TV show and then shifted from the show to being a full time film producer. So I've done three feature films since then. So to wrap all that up, I realized that I was good at producing outcomes through systems and I was really good at teaching those systems. And so what I decided in 2021 was to expand Craftsman Creative into kind of my personal brand. So it became a newsletter and a blog, and that blog turned into a book. And now I have coaching and consulting packages to be able to work one on one with people, as well as like come in and implement these essential systems into creative businesses. And I'm very lucky because it's a ton of fun. <laughs> it's so great when you can do something that brings you joy, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> it's essential. So I think the, the thing I've picked up is, two, well, two things. The first thing is that difference between the technical and the marketable value. Because, I mean, from that industry that you've come from, there was a very technical-based skill in terms of the video production and editing and all of that, right? But the other element that I was just thought about then was also what you did is shift your audience to whom you are selling. Because ordinarily, as a film producer, you know, your actual client is not actually potentially going to be, although we can talk about this when we get into diversifying income, you're probably going to tell me your high ticket pricing. Yes, you do go back to that client and go, hi, pay me 50 grand, right? <laughs> but you, what you have done is you've switched into what I call like a lateral audience where they're, they're actually audiences of your peers or they're audiences of people like you've, you know, I listened to a bit of your podcast where you're saying they're actually maybe potentially people that are 10 or 15 years behind you or five years behind you. If we go back to the technical skill and the marketable value a bit, because we've talked a bit about this on my podcast before, because Michael Hyatt kind of calls this difference, the difference between your aptitude and your proficiency, if you like. And I know that a lot of subject matter experts, especially in the creative industry, I want to find out if this is what you've learned in your experience. They're also very highly focused on their technical skills. So everything they package and their price is around time almost. Like, have you found that in that audience that you're working with and your creatives? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good and loaded question. So one of the things that I the mental shift that I made when I, I left a video production company that I'd ran for eight or nine years and then became a solo independent film producer. And one of the things like the mindset shifts that I had to make was I'm not a contractor. I'm not a vendor. I'm a partner. And so I don't charge by the hour. I put together offers and packages of my time. Sometimes other times it's outcomes that I'm delivering. And I'm pricing based on value, not based on my time or my technical ability. And so one of the things I repeat probably multiple times a day to the creators I work with and talk with online, it comes from Tony Robbins. He says that success is 80% mindset, only 20% strategy and skills. And inside that strategy and skills are your tactics, your technical ability, your skill set, right? And so what I've learned for myself and then as I work one on one with so many creators is that if you have a limiting mindset, you're stuck. If you if you come out the gate and the reasons that you're not successful are the market's bad, the economy's bad, the coronavirus is raging and all of these external reasons, that's a limiting mindset. You don't have any ability to control your destiny or control your outcome or your finances or the growth of your business or anything. Mm. And so you always have to unlock that first. That's the first step in my framework when I work with people is mindset. And then you've got to define the outcome. So for every individual, it's very different, right? There might be technical people who love having 
the stability of a nine to five job where they're making $50 an hour, a hundred thousand a year. They have pension, they have 401k matching, they have their regular commute yeah. and their regular coffee and their regular meals. And that is exactly what they are optimizing their life for. And there's nothing wrong with that. I can't do the same thing every day. I'm, I'm not built that way. So you have also have to define the outcome and go, what do you want your life to look like? What do you want your business to look like? How much time do you want to spend? How much money do you want to make? What kind of partners and clients do you want to work with? And the, all of that work has to come before you even say, this is what I do. This is how I help people. You've got to do all that internal, in your head, mindset, outcome work first. And that was a gift that I got from reading a book. So Cal Newport is another author I love. And he wrote a book called So Good They Can't Ignore You. And in it, he defines the craftsman <laughs> mindset. Where did the yeah. name Craftsman Creative come from? I stole it from that because, first <laughs> of all, my last name is Smith. So my ancestors were tinsmiths and blacksmiths and stuff. So we worked with our hands and stuff. And th that idea of an outcome-focused approach to creative work just really resonated because I'm a systems guy. And so mm -hmm. that's where we always start. And then it gets into the technical ability and the skill set. But what I see so often is that artists, especially and creative individuals, they think the answer is, well, I've got to do more art or I've got to get another degree or certification that proves that I'm good at this thing. None of that is true. In my experience, it really comes down to, do you believe you can do it? And are you going to be resourceful enough to go after it every day? We, we talk about this a bit on the podcast and also in my group. We talk about this in terms of your ideal working lifestyle because it kind of encompasses all of those things. And you've got to start with how do you, like you say, how do you want your work life balance? Not your, because I don't like work life balance, but life work how balance. How do you like your, it's an imbalance. It's like a seesaw that goes up and down yeah. all the time. I like to put but it first, like though, like say life work balance, and then it puts it in the proper order, right? <laughs> Look at you flipping that mind switch. Look at you. No, but you're right. And it's how does your ideal day look like? What does your ideal week look like? And it, nothing's right or wrong, but just figure it out. Because by knowing that, you can almost re-engineer what your services, you know, alongside understanding. I think part of people's problem with the mindset around their pricing or how they put things together is they don't always see examples of it happening and think, oh, okay, I get it now. I see what you mean. Yeah. Sometimes just having use case scenarios going, well, actually, you know, it is possible for you as a photographer to now have a mentoring program for other photographers or a mentoring program for event coordinators to better set themselves up for, you know, photographers or videography or media, whatever it is. So I think that comes a little bit, doesn't it, into that discussion about diversifying your income is actually trying to look for, and I know Daniel does this very well, Daniel Priestley, where he said, he just look for ideas in other industries, because if you keep staying in your bubble, you know, of, oh, well, I'm not really sure what other photographers have done. I've looked at photographers, but I don't really... You know, I don't really see how they're doing anything different, but actually look at a completely different industry, look at something that's completely different and you might be inspired. Yeah, I love that. And does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And it's really true to what I've done, right? Because Craftsman Creative is an extension of what I do as a film producer. So I take and I produce outcomes for people using systems. It's the same yes. job or the same skill set just applied to a different group of people. But, you know, I don't want to produce five, six, ten movies a year. That would kill me. It would ruin my marriage. I would have no time with my boys. And I, that's not the life that I was optimizing for. I want to do two movies a year. No. I'd like to make six figures a year doing that. That's pretty great. And I'm just at the point after like 15 years of being in this industry where I can actually charge 50000 plus for a movie as a producer. So it's not yeah. something that happens overnight either. People need to be patient and be willing to put in the time and the effort to create that lifestyle. It's not like, oh, I want this. And then two months later, you have it. That's rare. You're that hoping happens. for it. Yeah. So that's another mindset thing for you. But so you've like, you've talked about one of your. So that's one of your. OK, so we both like Daniel Priestley, right? Yes, so <laughs> let's get into <laughs> let's get into product ecosystems then. So talk us through what your product ecosystem looks like now, but also give the listeners a bit of an idea of 
how you've built that over a time frame, if you like, because sometimes that also helps you to give a bit of perspective as well. Yes, absolutely. So there's two principles here. One comes from Daniel Priestley, the way he teaches it and his team teaches it is that products don't make money, product ecosystems make money. And so we need to talk about what does a product ecosystem look like? And I actually built my product ecosystem in reverse order than I teach it now. And that's thanks to Brian Clark, who's over at Copy Blogger, and then sold that. And now he has Movement Ventures and Further and Unemployable Initiative. He's got all these really great uh, things. You can hear a conversation I had with him where this unlocked for me in uh, the 10K Creator Show. And he was episode nine of that season that we did. But your product ecosystem, a lot of people call it a sales ladder where you start where, like, with like a low ticket offer. So, uh, you'll see this a lot with um, authors or coaches where they'll say, get my book for free, just pay that. shipping. Try again? Sorry, Siri's interrupting our conversation. A lot of people <laughs> will start with a, like they call it a tripwire offer where it's just and I hate that term. And I hate the idea of funnels where it's like I'm going to. Feels like there's going to be an explosion. If it's I a know, wire. right? It's, it's like just such the wrong approach to, to building relationships with people. First, I'm going to blow off your leg. Uh, but they start with like a free book and that gets you into the thing. And then they quickly on the next page upsell you something for 90% off. And then every day of the week until you buy or bounce, they try to sell you an upsell, an upsell, an upsell. Join my event, join my coaching program, join my community, get one on one, blah, blah, blah. And then they just try to upsell, upsell, upsell infinitely. And I, I hate being in those funnels. We all know what they look and feel like. And they're terrible. It's, it's, it's the complete opposite way to build a relationship with people. But I kind of did that in a sense where I started with a free newsletter and a blog. And then I wrote a book based off of the blog that I was writing. And then I created a community and then I created coaching and consulting packages. But I actually didn't create the consulting package until I had this conversation with Brian Clark, where he said, look, start with the high ticket, the high value offer. Start there, because what happens is you identify the people that are willing and able to pay for your services. And you generally can need to sell less in order to make the same amount. So imagine a $15,000 consulting package. Well, how many books would I need to sell at $20 a pop in order to make $15,000? I don't try to do public math, but it's many books. It's more than I sell, which is like two or three a month. Because what happens is I give a number and then it's inaccurate because I don't actually make $20 a book unless it's the digital download. You have to subtract printing and shipping. And also that's not the profit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? So yeah, the, right. the point that's is... Good. I like public math. But... <laughs> it's, it's a good one. <laughs> but the point is you, you, have, you can sell less. So I don't have a big audience. I don't have 100,000 people online that follow me or 10,000 people on my email list. So how am I going to make $10,000 or $20,000 a month? Well, I could sell one or two of my high ticket consulting packages. So Brian mm. told me about this idea of like start there. And then what happens is it informs your mid ticket offer and your low ticket offer. And I scratched my head and I was like, okay, I want to believe you, but I actually don't understand how that works. And then I took a week or two to figure it out. And I had this client that had hired me for a one hour or 90 minute consulting session. And I went back to him and I said, hey, what if we did this? And I basically in real time, like, don't do this, like spend more time thinking through your offers. But I was doing <laughs> it as a test to see if there was any interest there. And I wrote him an email. I said, what if I came into your business and built out all of these systems and it was two months and you had access to me through email and whatever else other forms of communication we will hop on calls once every other week. And what do you think? I would probably be priced around, you know, $15,000. An hour later, he responded and said, where do I sign up? An hour after that, I had $15,000. So that was, a, that was proof in the pudding right there that like Brian knows what he's talking about. And then what happened was it completely changed my business from kind of doing a lot of random things and to having an actual product ecosystem where the high value offer is what's called your done for you service. That's where they get your time and your implementation. You're actually doing the work for them. That's what I do as a film producer. People pay me $50,000 and I go turn their financial investment into a movie by hiring crew and cast and locations and budget and schedule and all that stuff. Doing everything. Everything. Yeah, yeah. 
but then that informs your mid ticket or your done with you offer. So whatever outcome you're promising with your high value offer, you then promise the same outcome with your middle ticket, which is kind of your call it the 500 to 25 that $2,500 range where it's mm-hmm. events or done with you coaching or cohort based courses where they get some of your time, but they have to do the implementation. And then on the lowest mm-hmm. tier, this is the third part of your product ecosystem. You've got your do it yourself version. So your digital courses that are pre recorded, yeah. your book, your digital downloads, your templates, your email courses, any of those things that you charge money for. Mm-hmm. They're very high leverage because they don't require any of your time, but they also require a lot more scale. So what I like to do is it's almost the trickle down of if they're not, I'm doing it in reverse. If they're not ready for the high ticket Mm -hmm. offer, then I present them with the middle ticket Mm -hmm. and anyone else who's not ready to buy that yet, they are presented with my do it yourself offers of my book. So that's kind of the whole Ascension model. Yeah. You know, I know James Wedmore talks about his ascension model yeah. things, depending on how, yeah, so we almost start at the top and, yeah. But it kind of price anchors then, doesn't it? To go, well, actually, if you're mm-hmm. done for you is X, it kind of informs the price level then of how the rest is going to end up working out. But I think the other the other thing for people to to think about, though, when they're thinking of that product ecosystem is most of the time you want that to almost be the same ideal client, just at different points, in their buying journey or their business journey. And and in some cases, it might be that that high ticket is a completely different ideal client, but in very few cases. But does that does that ring true for you? Like you've had a bit more experience. It definitely does. <laughs> I haven't been the high ticket person yet. I think what it also does is it narrows that audience. So you get more and more focused the higher up you go in that pyramid or the higher you go up that sales ladder, if you want to call it that level, whatever so it is. Yeah. From the get go, I realized that I didn't want a big social media audience. I don't want to be internet famous. I don't want to have no. the the responsibility of showing up every day for an audience. Cause sometimes I go away for two months to make a movie like that would abandon the audience yeah. and that would not be a good strategy. Plus I just personally don't enjoy the idea of having 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 random people I've never met before following my life. I just, it just feels wrong. It gives me heart palpitations. A little bit, right? I know I need some audience. I need a minimum viable audience in order to have a business, but I kind of already have that. And my audience is like three or 4,000 people. I don't really need more than that. I can just keep doing this. But to answer your question, I knew from the get go when I kicked this off in August 2021 with my book, Craftsman Creative, I knew that I didn't want to go to everybody in the creator economy. It wasn't like, here's how to do all the things for everybody. There's no way that book would ever work. So the subtitle of my book is how five figure creators can build six figure businesses. So all of a sudden I'm calling out like this is not for brand new creators. This is not for aspiring. You're just out of school. You've never done it before. This is for people who have been doing the work for one, two, five, ten years, but haven't cracked that six figure threshold in their business. Well, that narrowed the audience and it allowed me to actually have better conversations with people because I was able to have the same conversations. They're all kind of in the same bucket. And then when I thought about this high ticket offer, I was like, okay, well, who do I go to? Oh, I just go to businesses. They're the same individuals, but now they have a business that's doing at least 500K a year and they've got three, four, five employees. So they're still acting like solo creators, but now they have the responsibility and the overhead of a business. Well, there's systems that I can bring in from film producing into their business and help them flesh it all out and really shift their mindset from artist to business owner, where you're not doing the work every day. You're not getting sucked into the day-to-day, working 60 hours a week, Mm. six days Mm. a week. You know, you're you're Mm. freeing up your time and using your team better and giving them some autonomy and, and empowering them to do some of the work. And it's amazing what happens where they go, they're completely overwhelmed. They're working 68, 70, 80 hours a week to like yeah. working 40 hours a week, making the same amount. They have time with their family. It all works because yeah. we put the systems in yeah. place that need to be there. So same idea, different, different phase of the business. Different phase of the business. Okay. So with Craftsman's Creator, I'm trying to think, okay, you're coming from the film background. 
are the people who are in your craftsman creative community, are they all from film or some kind of tangent of skill off of the film industry? Or are you finding that actually the content is is working for more than just that industry? That's I love that question because it's been top of mind recently as I just hit a hundred issues of my yeah. newsletter and about a year since my book launched. And I've it's a, it was a good yeah. moment to kind of reflect and go, am I on the right path still or do I want to shift? And one thing that was shown to me or told to me by a man named Sean Twing, I'm in his community. He and Andre Chaperone run the business tinylittlebusinesses.com. It's another one for the show notes because there's so many free resources in there around email marketing and oh, there's so much good stuff. But Sean said that in a podcast interview that the secret to success in these areas is by putting you, what you do, your skill set, your business in front of the people who already overvalue what you do. And that was like 10 light bulbs going off at the same time for me. Because what I realized is that 90% of the revenue that I had in 2022 came from video production company owners, filmer, filmmakers, video production people, and actually like being hired as a film producer. So why not lean into that? So now I'm actually narrowing even more so that my high ticket offer is really for video production companies and YouTube based businesses because they're video production companies just with a different distribution model. So. Yeah. Why not? I only need one or two clients a month. There are millions of YouTubers. So I'm, I, I have enough, right? I don't need to go to every type of creative business. I don't have an agency background, so I shouldn't be talking to agencies and marketing companies. I don't do marketing very well. Uh, I'm trying by getting on podcasts like this, but you know. Well, you're not, do, well, you're not doing I'm not badly. Not doing badly, Let's but it's not that. my no. not my strength, right? It's not my zone of genius, as they say. And so... By getting yourself in front of people who already overvalue what you do, what happens is they come to your business pre-sold. Like I just shared that example of emailing someone an offer and then it turning into $15,000. It's because they had already spent an hour and a half with me. They'd listened to a bunch of my podcasts. They'd list, read a bunch of my blogs and mm. newsletters mm. and had been on my email list for months. So they already knew me and overvalued what I did. And they they first heard about me because I was on a podcast like this, it would, a podcast mm -hmm. called Grow Your Video Business. And mm -hmm. that audience has represented like over $25,000 of revenue in six months from one podcast appearance because that audience overvalues what I do. So that's really where to place your focus as you're building out your business and your brand is going, I'm not everything for everyone everywhere all the time. I serve this mm -hmm. group of people really, really deeply. And I think that's what that's what many of us like I particularly struggle with as well, trying to go, okay, if I do particularly if you want to use the word niche or niche, I don't know where which angle of that ship you sit on. <laughs> it's how do you you know, like from my perspective, I know I'm in a really flooded market, right? So I'm asking for direct advice now. But I've particularly positioned everything around what I do for subject matter experts, so knowledge experts, people who are consultants, people who have to advise on subjects. But is that enough of a specialism or a niche, would you say, or do I need to go industry? It's, it's like, and I'm hoping that the listeners listening will be thinking the same kind of thing because, you know, I'm coming from a really flooded marketplace from where I am. So I really stand out by being a brand strategist and not necessarily just marketing. But it's trying to work out then, because you almost need to work that out a little bit more, don't you, before you even start thinking of that ascension model. Yeah, I love, this is my favorite type of podcast interview where it turns into a coaching session. <laughs> no, I actually truly love it. So let's get dirty here. It's, it really comes down to what I was just talking about. Who already overvalues what you do so that you're not a commodity? You're not just another brand strategist. You are actually someone who mm. deeply understands their problems, their needs, their jobs to be done. And you have offers in place to directly solve those problems, get the outcomes that they care about in a way that resonates with them. So that's about putting your values out into the world, putting content out there that speaks to their needs and their struggles and their desires. And then I like to let the audience kind of be discovered because I've done it many times where I've said, I'm going to go serve that audience. 
And they said, no, thanks. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that doesn't work. It just doesn't. And so what I did last year was I did about 15 podcast appearances. I created a podcast with my friend Joe Polizzi from The Tilt. And I had my own podcast. And so what I was doing, and I, again, this goes back to the idea of being patient and giving yourself years of time to figure this time. stuff out. Yeah. I knew I wasn't going to figure it all out in a year. And so the hundredth mm-hmm. issue of my newsletter is the milestone of like, okay, I've done a hundred. What do I now know that I didn't know before? And the answer was the people that overvalue what I do are video production company owners and YouTube channel people, businesses that have three, four, five employees, they're doing half a million or more a year, and they really Mm -hmm. are desperately struggling to get their head above water because all they've done is just Mm -hmm. scaled, 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 scaled without building systems. So, okay, Mm -hmm. I'm going to come in and build those for you. We're going to be friends and and they already overvalue what I do. So what happens Mm -hmm. is they come to me pre-sold. By the time they reach out to me, they're not saying, how can you help me? They're saying, I know exactly how you can help me and I am ready to buy it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what does that, what does that mean for me, Darren? What that means for you is (laughs) experimenting with a couple of different like verticals or niches in that industry, right? If you're talking about knowledge experts, right? Is that the term you use? Yeah. So, well, uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't like, I've just done a podcast episode about this, about subject matter experts, but um, yeah, they're knowledge workers. So generally they are people that have, you know, years and years of experience. They might have technical skill, but they also have that proficiency element. So it's, it's knowledge that they're guiding and advising people on. So they could be, you know, a health and safety advisor. They could be, you know, those kinds of things, but I'm trying to think, well, do I stick within the marketing realm or the, or the, you know, the brand realm, or do I stick within the creative realm or do I stick with, do you know what I mean? And I'm asking this as a, as a listener as well, because I know I've got a couple of listeners who are probably thinking the same thing. No, it's brilliant. It's so perfect. It's the exact right question. So my answer is to experiment by getting in front of those audiences that are already exist all over the internet, right? So you have an audience of people And that's why I came on the show, because I want to get in front of your audience to see, are there people in there that are going, oh, I like what he's talking about. That idea makes sense. I want to learn more. It's an experiment. I don't know for sure. And so I didn't pay money to come on the show because there's no there's no certainty there. Whereas you could pay to be on certain shows where it's like, oh, that's a video production company audience. I'd like to pay to come on that show because I know that that's the audience. But what happens, and for you, you could say, okay, I'm going to go to authors. I'm going to go to course creators. I'm going to go to event people that do like seminars and conferences and things like that. I'm going to go to educators. I'm going to go to governments. I'm going to go to, maybe you identify five, six different verticals or niches inside the bigger umbrella of this industry. And then the other piece that you need is a really no brainer offer. Something that says, I know exactly where you are. I know exactly what you're struggling with. And I have a way to help you. And this is what it looks like. It's, there's a book called The Three Minute Pitch or The Three Minute Rule. Sorry, The Three Minute Rule by a man named Brant Pinvidic. <laughs> but The Three Minute Rule. And this will completely shift your mindset around how to put a pitch together for your offer, for your product, your service, or your business. It could be for your podcast. Mm -hmm. It could be for something that you provide as a service. Mm -hmm. So get it into a three-minute version where you can say, this is what it is. This is how it works. This is the proof that I've done it before. And this is something about me that and my values that help you resonate with, oh, this is the right person to work with. That's the 30-second version of that book. But what you're going to do is you're going to put that offer all over the internet. Put it on your blog, put it on your newsletter, and then go to other people's audiences and put it in front of them and see what happens. And there might be one or two of those verticals that really show up. And what that means is that they overvalue what you do. And then you have a choice. Do you want to work with health and ser- human services people? Or is that not interesting? Yeah, yeah. To you? you can always say no, mm. but now you at least know that that was a thing that resonated with that audience and you could then expand and double down and do more of what works, less of what doesn't. Yeah, so I think ultimately the uh, what I get from that is still carry on with the whole test 
test feedback, repeat test feedback. Yeah, yeah I mean, this so, is episode okay, so, I'm the, so I'm in the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm I'm gonna keep going to learn, go. Darren. <laughs> yeah, and what might happen because like I'm gonna share this episode in my newsletter and on social media, and you might have one individual, whether it's a Mark Masters or me or someone else that's come on, that that their audience shows up, and you're like, whoa, what just happened there? Oh, well, what, Darren's audience is consultants and coaches and brand people in his yeah. community. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Well, let me. Maybe you come back to my community and you do a guest uh, thing on my podcast or we do a workshop and you just constantly, it's that same idea. Do more of what works, less of what doesn't based on the outcomes that you've set for yourself and your business. I think it's just, oh, just don't lose steam. I think, I think I'm 13 years in. I think I'm Darren of a couple of years ago. <laughs> so I think I'm just, uh, but, I, but I, I think I'm doing the right things. And I think the people that I'm teaching are doing exactly that as well. And it is about just sharpening your message. And I do try and say to people, well, you still need to find your voice. You know, so the reason why you start things or you start to create things is to find your voice as well. Find what gives you joy as well, which might be completely different to what you're doing, you know, in your normal day to day stuff, and then start to get that feedback so that you realize that you're giving value, you know, like what you've got people want. You know? yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, good summary. Much. That's solid. Oh, okay. <laughs> very good. Very good. Before we jump off, I know we got to, we've actually been a bit longer today, but um, I think it's been valuable, a valuable conversation. Um, before you jump off, you know, you were employed at some point in time. You were employed at some point in time, Darren. What happened to make you jump that ship <laughs> in a couple of sentences? Yeah, well, I've, I've always been self-employed. Um, there was a stint where I did three or four months working at a car dealership selling cars for Porsche, Audi, Volkswagen Group. That was right at, it was like a month after I got married in 2009. The, the financial crisis just completely wiped out all the film work here in Utah. And I went from making a couple thousand a month to like, I, I, the first month of our marriage, I think I made like $1,500. And I was like, this isn't going to work. So I went and got a job because I didn't see any, I didn't see light at the end of the tunnel yet in film. So I went and got a job. It's the only job I've had and the only job I've ever been fired from. But that's another story <gasps> for another day. So I'll leave it at that. But I ran a video production company for eight or nine years from like 2009, 10 until 2017 when I left that business. And over those 10 years, our business didn't grow. So I started that business and made like $35,000 that year. And when I left the business, I made $35,000 that year, but also was $15,000 in debt trying to keep the business afloat personally, which is not a good decision. Don't do that. So I really had that jump ship moment of, okay, what do I do? Do I go and get a job somewhere? And that instantly felt wrong. And so that's not for me. So what I did was I decided to branch out on my own and see if I could make it as a solo independent film producer. And what instantly happened was I doubled my revenue because I was no longer splitting the revenue with the business partner. But then the first year I doubled my income. The second year I doubled it again. So I went from making 35K a year to 150K a year. And so again, this was all around the exact same time that I was reading so good they can't ignore you, learning about mindset stuff. I went to a Tony Robbins yeah. event, which completely blew everything out of the water. And I started from scratch and rebuilt. But that's why Craftsman Creative exists the way it does. It's a business built on contribution and growth, not about significance and making a certain amount of money or any of that kind of stuff. It's really about how do I help the most people in the deepest way. And it's crazy what happens when you actually align your goals and your business and your work with who you really are and what drives you. So I'm lucky that it happened for me that way. I, I attribute a lot of the success to grace because it's definitely not just me being really good at life. (laughs) It's certainly like I got lucky and I had a lot of help from a higher power that's going, yeah, you're doing the work that I would like you to be doing and you're helping people. That's pretty cool. But also you're listening to your your gut instinct as to yeah. what you're, you know, what would give you joy. Basically. Absolutely. That's a nice roundup there, Darren. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think Mark was right. I think we did all right. Yeah. Uh, really pleased to have you in my little business lifeboat now. <laughs> and I'm going to have to pick your brain about 
film and movies and all of those kinds of things oh, yeah. another day. <laughs> <laughs> that can be part two. <laughs> right. Yes, that would be part two. So if anybody wanted to find out about Craftsman Creative, Darren, or find out how to work with you, where's the best place for them to do that? Yes. Thank you for asking. So head over to craftsmancreative.co. And I have a free newsletter that I put out every week. And there's also a welcome series of like five emails that'll really give you the nice overview of what I do and how to shift your mindset. So it's all about mastering the creator economy. But there's two other things that I would love to share with your audience that are kind of like freebies. Yeah, go for it. Um, one yeah, is yeah. I do these free workshops every month where I just walk people through my framework and it's a workshop. Mm -hmm. So it's not just information. It's actually doing some of the work in real time. So it's a great way to use an nice. hour, hour and a half of your time. Just go to workshops.craftsmancreative.co for that. And then I also have a free scorecard which is awesome Ooh. because it's almost like getting a little bit of consulting from me for free. And if you are a consultant or a coach or something like that, this is another Daniel Priestley product. So he, his name keeps popping up, but go to score app or just really go to scorecard.craftsmancreative.co. And you can even click on the little badge at the bottom to, to get your own scorecard. But what it is, it's like a personality quiz. It's like a personality quiz for your business where you can answer 20 quick questions and get some really good feedback from me as far as resources and podcast episodes and blog posts that will just say, I know exactly the area that you need to focus on in your business based on your answers. So start there. Don't try to build every system at the same time. Just focus on one. And I've seen people double their business just by implementing one of the kind of four core systems that I talk about with my content. Oh, brilliant. And that's a freebie. So go over to scorecard.craftsmancreative.co. Uh, we'll pop that in the notes Thank as you. well with all of your bits. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me for the conversation and sharing your journey and your passion for what you do, Darren. Clearly, you've got a world of experience and insight and look forward to getting to know you more and your genius as time goes on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. This was awesome. Yeah, so okay. fun. And that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Did that help you to see more clearly that it is possible to design services that tap more into your proficiency ratio, that extra intangible value you have that is over and above your technical skill? Is your brain tingling with ideas of what you could shape and create for your ideal clients, which you maybe are not doing right now? I love that Darren has also shared the difference of the impact of the pandemic made to fuel his motivation to change how he was earning his revenue. Sometimes having something wildly dramatic happen to the economics of how you carry out your work can clear the way to show you that you could do something completely different with the knowledge and skills that you have. Who knows, it might get you closer to your ideal working lifestyle. Who do you know that could do with hearing this conversation and Darren's journey? Share this episode. You know you want to. Until then, stay strong, believe you have value, and make good brand decisions. Thank you for listening to The Brand Compass. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to share it with your entrepreneurial friends and help them make good brand decisions. Until next time, let's keep the conversation going at ShellyRosland.com.